and welcome back to Punchline. Now, Kenya appears to have had the worst of luck after food prices hit a five-year high in 2019. Now, many had hoped that 2020 would be different. Well, it has only been worse with biblical-style locust plague coming upon us, followed by COVID-19 and now raging floods. Experts warn that the compounded impact of these calamities could be dire for millions of Kenyans unless there's urgent intervention. Agriculture Cabinet Secretary Peter Munya joins us now to discuss this and more. And good evening and thank you so good much uh, for joining us. So what is the uh, general update in terms of the food security situation on the back of those myriad of challenges that have talked about COVID-19, the locusts, the ongoing uh, heavy rains in parts of the country? Yes, we've been monitoring the food situation actually on a weekly basis. We even set up a, a, a situation room or a war room mm -hmm where we are picking statistics and information across the country. And we have also required the county to set up their own to feed the national war room mm -hmm. with information. So we are okay with the food situation. The food available is enough. We see gaps in the uh, end of May, uh, towards the end of June there, mm. before we come to the next harvest. And largely, the shortage is, is missed, not, not the rest of the staples. Okay. And we have taken care of uh, that by carrying out the importation that the uh, cabinet approved of 2 million uh, bags of uh, white mace and 2 million bags of uh, yellow mace for animal feed. All right, so we'll talk so about this. So the overall in... picture is that it... really there is a crisis okay. that, that we would uh, say looking at the usual imports that come across the borders, mm -hmm. what we produce uh, locally, mm. uh, the staples, we, we, we have enough food. Okay. Um, yet the Kenya Food Security Steering Group estimates that at least 1.3 million Kenyans are facing crisis or possibly worse outcomes based on the data they collected in the 2019 short trains assessment period. So though, yes, it is true that we are doing better than the uh, previous uh, harvest, still it's over a million Kenyans who are in crisis. So what are the immediate challenges that you're facing right now, specifically owing to COVID-19? Yeah, COVID-19 has brought in a, a challenge in, in, in agriculture. Uh, first of all, close our markets, uh, mm. especially where we, are, we were exporting our, our, our agricultural produce, mm. and the challenge of even accessing the local ones, mm. and also customers going to the market. So there is a challenge along the value scene in terms of markets, in terms of transportation of food, even in terms of farming, as you observe the guidelines of uh, health to managing COVID-19. Mm. But we have worked out, uh, you know, protocols on how to support the, 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 the sector so that farmers can continue growing food, markets can open, because not to the optimum that that, that would happen. Mm. Factories also that, that buy food and process also have been facilitated to be operating. Yeah. But there is no question about it that uh, this crisis has also impacted heavily on agriculture. But what if specifically in terms example, of farming, like yes. in terms of the actual input of the farmer to the field, how are they being impacted by COVID-19? Well, uh, for example, I remember the, the, at the very beginning, before people understood uh, lockdown was not uh, mm. stopping everything, mm. uh, there were challenges uh, by officials not even understanding, stopping people from going to the farm, stopping mm. workers from going to the farm. Right. Eventually, we intervened and uh, worked out on a way to allow farmers to continue going to farm and also farmers to be able to access inputs in the shops. We organize with you know, transporters uh, to make sure fertilizer is available and other chemicals are available in the mm. shops. Mm. And the sensitization was also done at the county level to make sure that farmers understand that farming will still continue even as they observe the, 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 the requirements of the public health. So, do, uh, And what do you expect is the impact of that? The fact that there was a misunderstanding in the beginning farmers thought they could not even farm. Do you see that actually affecting significantly what you expect for harvest or not? Certainly the impact in terms of mm. uh, production uh, levels could, could go down. Mm. There's no question about that. Significantly? Uh, we, da we haven't done any assessment yet, okay. but uh, we will do an assessment which, mm. can, which can inform us on the extent of the, the challenge. Remember, mm -hmm. even flowers, farms mm. closed, with, even harvesting could not take place. So reorganizing to go back to production mm. was not easy. So there will be some significant impact which we want to assess and see how we can 
um, repurpose uh, our resources to focus on on, on, on supporting farmers and mm. supporting families mm. to make sure we go back to total production the way we were before before then. Uh, but just very quickly and, and briefly, if you would. So last month you stated that the government does not intend to buy maize from local farmers. Um, and at the time that you made that statement, we had maize available uh, up until uh, for one more month, which is the month we are currently in, uh, May. So mm. first, where do we stand in terms of maize specifically? How much is in stock now? Usually... Um, we, when we, we say food security, sometimes we mistake, we, we confuse the stocks that are within government stores. Mm. We, start, we look at them and say it's food security. Mm. But when you store food in government stores, so if you look at the, the, the maize we consume, for example, mm. and what we store, what we store is a fraction. Mm -hmm. Even what we buy from the public is a small fraction. We buy around the total capacity for NCPB is 2 million mm. bucks. Mm. Uh, yes. supporting exactly. uh, uh, what we spend. Mm -hmm. So when we do an assessment, we mm -hmm. don't just look at what we store in, in, in government stores. We look at the entire availability mm -hmm. of food, even you know, across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the challenges we have been having, mm -hmm. where importations and, the, and government involvement in buying has been distorting the market, making it very difficult for trading, proper trading for commodities, mm -hmm. government has decided to withdraw from buying, directly buying, mm -hmm. uh, to a situation where if we need food, uh, at the time it's needed, the ministry that is supposed to intervene in those circumstances would buy directly and uh, you know, give it out there, not government storing. So we are Fair carrying enough, out reforms. But just in as far as how much yes. maize is, is available currently, because the, the show, at the time you were projecting up until May. Yeah. So what does it look like the now? The projection you... is that between uh, actually end of June, not May, mm -hmm. end of end June, of June mm -hmm. to uh, mid end of July, mm -hmm. there will be a shortage of 2 million bags. Okay. And that's what we were importing. And that's why we have given the importers up to 30th of May. To bring in this maize. Okay, so it's not yet in, in the market. It's not in the market yet. Okay, let's go to the policy position. And you can see because of that importation, yes. prices were shooting. Yes. When the hand there was importation, they started now stabilizing, coming down for prices of maize. Okay. Because part of it was people holding, thinking government is going to buy. Mm -hmm. and they at a higher price. At a higher price. Well, thinking. What do you think the price should be? Well, well the, the current price, and, and of course the prices vary from mm. one region to another. Mm. Uh, we usually look at the Rift Valley. <clears throat> which is the main producer of maize, and we judge it from there. Mm -hmm. So the prices are around 2,900 to 3,000. Sometimes they can even go higher and come down. But what, what does the government think is reasonable? Because uh, I'm sure you agree that it is reasonable for farmers to make a reasonable profit. Yes, it did. Right. So what, reason, what is reasonable? Actually, the reason why we mm -hmm. didn't want to interfere with the market is because we thought those prices are good for the farmers. And uh, around 3,000, even the importation we are doing, the, the, the maize that is coming, we factored in a duty. In fact, we imposed a duty of 14% on the, yellow, on the white maize and 10% on the yellow maize to make sure that when that maize arrives, it sells at the same price of 3,000 shillings, which we think is a fair compensation for the farmer. Many people still feel that, first, the price at the gate. Yes. At the farm gate and the price at the market, the, the farmer isn't the one who's making the profit. It's the middleman at that point. And second, that if there's any profit to be made, then the government should leverage that profit towards the local farmer than a foreign farmer from where we are importing goods. Why does policy not seem to have that Kenyan preference first? Well, to mop up everything that our farmers have first? Well, if you, if you say you mop up what the, the farmers have, you, 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 know, you don't look at food security by, again, as I said, mm -hmm. looking at government stores. Because what you, if you did that, you'd be saying, yeah. we buy to come and store uh, in government stores. Even if we did that and they sell it back to the millers, mm -hmm. we will still have the shortage of maize we require. Because what you are lacking is uh, enough maize stocks in the country. And you made an important yeah. point about yes. how you view food security. First of all, to disassociate it from a maize specifically, you're talking about the general food that is available. You've talked yes. about the amount that we produce, and then you've disputed the import of how much government is actually holding and storing. But certainly this is a, an important point, how much food is in reserve, if you like, in terms of emergency stocks, etc. And this appears to be an area where we've always fallen short. You've just talked about the capacity of NCPB 
for instance. Yes. Why hasn't this been front and center in terms of policy that in 2020, with technology available to us, not only do we need to be producing in mass nutritious mm. food, but we also, bearing in mind natural calamities and others, need to store food in good conditions in mass as well. If you look at uh, our reforms, the ones we are carrying out, we actually want to move away from physical food storage by government. Even NCPB, we are turning it into a trading division. There will be a, a trading division of NSB where it will be buying like everybody else, storing and selling like everybody else. And then there will be a division that will be monitoring food stocks. The one we used to call strategic food reserve is mm. now a unit mm. that will not be buying food. It will just be monitoring. And then now providing government with policy decisions on what to do to intervene to make sure that food prices are stable and there is available food. So we won't keep physical food stocks Again, we will be keeping money so that if, that, if there is need for food, warehouses that uh, are being developed across the, the country, we can intervene by uh, going to those warehouses, buying, or giving money to the needy people to buy themselves directly. Why is that and the And this right is decision? what we are calling the... Why know, the shift? Why the shift in policy? The shift in policy is because the, the other policy was profiting, making a mineral men and the powerful people within government make money mm. when the farmer is suffering. You see maize, for example, being imported when the harvest is at, just at the corner, which collapses the prices. Because the farmer now, where will he sell? You have already imported mm. a lot of maize stocks. Mm. Their food is just coming from the harvest. Mm. The prices collapse. Mm. And then after that, because the prices have collapsed, you want now to go and buy, to the, to buy from the farmers mm. at an inflated prices. So government keep losing money and nobody benefits from that kind of arrangement. So we want to create a system that is fair so that proper trading, private sector drives the market and the government comes in only to, to, to manage volatility, volatility and also do interventions where it's needed. Right. And this will shift from uh, actually giving relief to giving money. And mm. that's why even in this COVID-19 response, mm. government is not distributing food. Government mm. is largely transferring money directly to the needed people mm. who then will go to their nearest shop and buy what they need. And, and when do you, is, do you expect those reforms to be completed? When should NCPB be now that trading, I believe you called it a, a, a trading what company? In fact, in, uh, in the next season, mm -hmm. the reforms will be completed. Already, cabinet passed the mm. cab memo that allowed us to close strategic food uh, reserve. Mm. We have already decasseted it. Mm. Right now, Treasury is working out the debts that have been there to sort out those debts. Mm. And then now we we'll have one, one board. In fact, I'm reconstituting the board for NCPB mm -hmm. because it's now taking over uh, the role that the uh, Strategic Food Reserve had. If you look at the act that right. created NCPB, you realize actually mm -hmm. it, the law already created mm. a Strategic Food Reserve to be a division within NCPB. Mm -hmm. But somewhere on the way, we lost it and we created another institution separate mm. that we call Strategic Food Reserve. So those reforms are on the way. The reforms also supporting farmers through inputs by sending them money and then they buy themselves directly from uh, you know, stores that are already recognized through the warehouse resisting system. We're also on board already. Uh, the e-voucher system, which okay. is already being, being actually piloted by this uh, COVID-19 response. Right, but again, Cabinet Secretary, mm -hmm. I, I really must ask, I, is the government not putting too much trust uh -huh. in private sector to deal with a basic, uh, actually a basic human right, the, the access to food? What confidence do you have that private sector will keep prices low and affordable? And whereas you're talking about giving money, we already know food prices in Kenya are amongst the highest in the world. Last year, we were looking at a five-year high. In a time of crisis where we have climate change and other exacerbating factors that are affecting our ability to control food, shouldn't really this be the preserve of government first and foremost to be able to give actual food, not just money to buy food, but actual food to its citizens? How do you well, abandon well, that I, to I, private I, sector I, I and market you, forces? You need to see, because this, this is just one of the aspects of the reforms we are carrying out. Mm. But uh, if you look at our agricultural growth and uh, growth and uh, uh, transformation strategy, which is driving the entire reforms in the agricultural sector, you will see we also have plans and the programs that are intended to assist uh, small-scale farmers grow their income, 
also expand their production and also bring prices down by making sure that the cost of production is also low. Uh, so those plans are there. It's not just the actual process of supporting those who need the food, but we have our whole you know, uh, uh, programs and projects that are planned to make sure that we also expand production put more land under productive uh, agricultural production mm. and at the same time support uh, families, especially small scale farmers, mm. and produce their own food, produce more mm. and also produce at a, a cost that doesn't make the food uh, prices rise. Right, so let's talk and, about that uh, rise because mm. you warned last month that the government will not hesitate to invoke the Price Control Act uh, which allows Treasury to set the prices for essential commodities. Uh, but hasn't the horse already bolted in mm. that fact? We've, we've seen media reports of uh, you know, a mother being forced to boil stones because she could not afford food for her children. Stories like this are way too common. Is the government not alive to the fact that the cost of food is already out of reach for millions of Kenyans? Well, there, there has been some spike in terms of the prices of food because, of course, uh, this crisis we have, COVID-19, is, is, is a problem. Mm. Uh, it has impacted on, on, on the food pricing. Mm. And that's why government is intervening in picking the data of those families and people who have that challenge to be supported directly. And uh, already in the hotspots where we have uh, COVID-19, that program of supporting people with with uh, money to, to, to buy food is already What's the challenge place. in reaching every needy household? There has been a challenge, especially, uh, you know, even though we said we have enough, we have technology that can mm. make people access uh, money online. Mm. There are areas that are quite remote, are difficult to, even some, we don't even, don't even have a phone in some of those areas. That's why government is also combining both. Especially in the urban areas, that's where you are giving the money directly. But in, in the rural areas, uh, where it's still very difficult to connect people directly and give them money, government is still supporting. But do you agree the that the price of food is still way too high? Even no, I for, agree it completely. For, for, so, and, and that's why I'm asking, yes. isn't it late in the day? Shouldn't you have already invoked the Price Control Act and controlled these prices? Uh, invoking the Price uh, Control Act is, is a very problematic thing. Eh? It's not something you do... Uh, just like that, because, because it will mean fixing prices artificially without compensating the people who are also in the business of selling food. Because prices sometimes are also determined by the cost of production. So if you don't address the cost of production and other uh, bottlenecks that make the pricing go up, you don't solve the problem by just controlling the prices. And somebody will say so, that so, sounds so, like you're, pro you're again uh, protecting business, not protecting uh, 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 average Kenyans. I'm also saying you are, you are protecting also the farmer. Because if you tell me I sell my, my milk at this price because you are controlling the price and you are not taking care of the, the cost of producing, and then there is a problem there. So government can invoke the Price Control Act in very extraordinary circumstances. We don't think we have reached there yet. And that's what why would be an extraordinary circumstance? We looked at five-year highs in 2019. We're just short of that this year. So... What? Remember, for example, when, uh, when the government uh, actually uh, brought in millers right. and told them to produce mills at a particular price. Mm -hmm. Remember that time mm -hmm. during uh, mm -hmm. the, the, towards the campaign? Mm -hmm. Prices had gone too much and there was a crisis in the country. Uh, government came in to intervene. Mm. Of course, the intervention was not very well thought out because of the crisis at that time. Some would say the intervention uh, was political. Uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was an election coming. Okay, now we can use the Price Control Act. I, yes. The rest uh, of the uh, time, uh, Kenyans can buy it at whatever price. Uh, what government did then was not even price control because you contracted millers. Government mm. contracted millers mm. to actually produce price uh, maize, uh, you know, uh, hunger at a particular price, mm. and government was supposed to pay those millers for, mm. for that. And you know that, that problem is still there even now. They have not been able to determine who, who, who did what and who need to be paid what. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, pricing control can be messy because it distorts the market I in a big way and, and uh, stops fair trading and mm -hmm. fair compensation for, for the trading and therefore can cause a big problem. Right, okay. Two quick but, questions uh, for you, sir, yes. before uh, we conclude. And, and one, I just want to 
um, unfortunately have to sort of bundle up all the questions on uh, climate change, uh, including the issue of the impacts of pests and disease. Um, to, in 2020, uh, of this, uh, this January, the January 2020, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization was saying the number of locusts in East Africa would expand by 500 times by next month. In your own assessment, is that the case? Where is the government in terms of controlling this scourge? And do you feel any confidence that now with the rainfall, though it is more than what uh, it was uh, expected, will mm. be able to replenish yeah. pasture and crop that has been destroyed by the locusts? Yes, indeed, uh, there has been quite some damage mm. by, by locusts, especially the pastoralist areas. Mm because most of the farming areas uh, were not affected. There was some, some innovation into those areas, but not as big as uh, the northern, northern uh, pastoral areas, where you still have locusts even to this day. Yeah. But we have done a lot of work in containing them. In fact, it's just that we've not been uh, in the press about it, but we have nine planes uh -huh. that are surveying and uh, spraying every day. Mm -hmm. We have county units of over 500 people who are trained who are also doing ground spraying mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. We have 500 NYS uh, teams with uh, equipment that are also spraying every day. Every day. Every Is it day. still prevalent in the 21 counties? Or has that uh, reduced? That we have been able to reduce actually to five counties. Five counties. The worst hit are? Uh, there is uh, largely Samburu mm. and Isiolo are the worst hit, mm. followed by Masabit mm. and bit of Trukana. Mm. And a little bit of Laikipia, especially Laikipia in the, in, the, in, the, in the ranches, not, not in the farming areas. Are you concerned about a second wave or do you think you have eliminated that? We with are the regular concerned spring? about the second wave uh, because we don't control what happens in other countries. Mm. So we are uh, alert, our teams are ready in case a new wave comes from outside. Within the country, actually we reduced uh, maybe what was left is probably... <coughs> Less than a third of, 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 of the locusts. My team just came from the ground uh, mm. uh, yesterday mm. that are going to do an assessment. Mm. And the report I'm getting is we are doing extremely well in terms of containing the situation. Okay. So we believe, even if we got a second wave from outside, mm. and uh, what we are dealing with now, because we've really, really, really uh, mm. brought it down, mm. we can see you manage okay. with. with uh, of course, minimum damage. In, in a, like a one-word answer, if possible. Yes. So uh, overall, the impact of the locusts on this year's harvest. Uh, severe? The significant? Negligible? The, uh, the first assessment showed that we had around 58,000 acres affected by, by locusts. Uh -huh. That was an estimate. Uh -huh. Next week, in fact, the challenge has been... Uh, uh, development partners are the ones who have been supporting us through FAO mm. to do some of the interventions. Mm -hmm. And the assessment is going to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we are confident by next week mm -hmm. uh, because now the okay has been given by the headquarters in FAO to do the assessment. Mm. So we should be able to know in another three or four weeks how much damage has and how much money we require uh. to, to support livelihoods in those areas that are affected by by locusts. Wow. And final question. You're obviously a, a seasoned politician. I yes, can see the way you're looking yes. at me. I'm not asking you a political <laughs> question. I'm yes, I would say I am. You're a seasoned I'm, politician. I'm you are. I've covered you. As, yes. I've been in politics for almost 20 years. For, now, so exactly. I would, say, I would say I am seasoned. You are. And yes. so you obviously know that uh, a hungry man is an angry man. And I'm sure you see for, uh, uh, both from being a politician and now being in the executive in a more technical capacity, the correlation between that anger and politics. Yes. And national st uh, uh, stability, if you like. We are inching closer to an election which is already being colored with, uh, unfortunately, a lot of division and divisive uh, uh, messages in the run-up to it. I mean, on top of that, then you have... The food situation. People see a woman boiling stones, and that hurts everybody. That hurts every Kenyan to see the kind of desperation that our fellow brothers and sisters have. And I just wonder from your standpoint, to what extent do you see the urgency of ensuring that families are not killing themselves to get you know, meals on the table for their children, and how that relates to the stability of the country? No, absolutely. The, the 
securities at the center of a country's stability, uh, both politically and even economically, mm -hmm. and therefore making sure that there is enough food, which is also affordable, because you can have enough food uh, produced, but mm -hmm. accessing it in terms of affordability is a problem. So making sure there is enough food and food that is also affordable is a critical element in, in our agricultural transformation uh, strategy. And that's why I was telling you, we need another time to come and explain all the programs that we have in place that are being impl implemented in all the counties to help families produce food, mm -hmm. uh, increase income in their pockets, mm. uh, and they at the same time, of course, have the extra uh, food that they can also be able to sell out there and make right. some, uh, some money. We have those programs running in agricultural counties. We right. have them running in livestock counties. Mm -hmm. We are value chain targeted programs mm -hmm. that are looking at our our staples mm -hmm. and seeing how to support them to grow even more. So, so okay. and this is what I'm saying. We need need more time. Of course, the other ministries that are now involved in in uh, supporting the vulnerable, yes. feeding them. That is the Ministry of Devolution mm -hmm. and also the Department of uh, Social Protection. Mm -hmm. I also also have programs that are and gear and target and those vulnerable people to make sure that right. nobody goes angry. You're saying you appreciate the, the magnitude yes, I do. of, of, I of do. what this is. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, I would love to keep chatting with you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, but we want to thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, forward to coming back. Absolutely. You're most welcome. We're taking a short break. We're back after this.